This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. When you live a notorious life, you're more feared than respected. See my face! The most vicious. The most violent. Love, hate, kill, take. The most dominant. Who the f are we? Get what you want because you take what you want. You dig? Gangland is most notorious. Gangland. There are about one million gangsters stalking America's streets. They can be found in every state and every city. If the police come right here, we beating their ass. Through unprecedented access to this lawless world. It was just about killing, killing, killing. We've told their violent stories. All I wanted to do was hurt people. And revealed their dirty secrets. If they were making fun or they did something serious to us, we'd bring them alive. Along the way, certain gangsters stood out due to their frightening and vicious ways of life. Now, for the first time, Gangland has gathered the most hardcore G's to reveal. My most notorious, notorious, notorious. We live that Grammy-nominated rapper Snoop Dogg was born and raised in the ganged-up neighborhoods of Long Beach, California. There were a lot of notorious guys around me. You know, killers, riders, jackers, you name it. Growing up sort of fatherless, like a lot of the kids from the east side, these notorious figures became our father figures. Snoop Dogg was once a member of the Rolling Twenties Crips before becoming a rap star. While he has left the streets, his music is still inspired by his old hood. It's all life. If you take my head away, whatever I'm rapping about gonna still come out because it's in my heart. It's not in here, it's in my heart. They always say you can take the homeboy out the hood, but you can't take the hood out the homeboy. The streets also provided inspiration for gangster rap pioneer Ice T. I've been fortunate to see a lot of the sides of LA. See, I not only saw the gang bang inside, I saw the drug deal inside. Ask your mama what this is. I saw the hustle inside, the pimp inside, the boost inside. So I walk lightly. I'm very fortunate to be this age and made it out of there. Ice T attended LA's infamous Crenshaw High School in the mid 1970s with some of the original Crips. Ice T never joined but he turned the grittiness of the streets into gangster rap. It's kind of like cheerleading for the hood, you know? And uh, I started to tell the stories of the streets, you know, how easy you could get shot, how easy you could get, get dealt with out there. Uh, I have actual gang banging rhymes that nobody's ever heard. You want to hear a gang, a, a gang rhyme? Strolling through the city in the middle of the night, on my left and on my right, yelling, cook, 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 ripped every I see. If you bad enough, come with me. Snoop Dogg and Ice T rhyme about notorious G's from two categories gangsters that take orders and gangsters that give them. The ones that give the orders are known as shot callers.
shot caller. Those are the people in the set that can actually make things happen. Those are the people you need to know. Once you become the shot caller, the whole world knows. Shot callers lead by violent example. Anytime there was a fight, if it was an enemy, you know, I'm trying to stab him with a screwdriver. I'm trying to stab him with a knife, whatever. You know, a pitchfork, whatever, I don't care. But only one can be considered the most notorious. I didn't have a heart, no compassion for anybody. In my own way, I felt I was the black Scarface. Most notorious shot caller. Wasn't nobody that didn't live in that particular area was gonna come over there with anything. You know, plain and simple. We were getting shot and we were shooting. That seed had bursted, so, you know, we were doing that Wild Wild West thing. Ramon Williams, AKA Paps, learned to gangbang on the streets of LA before moving to Las Vegas. I distinctly remember Vegas didn't have the reputation that it had then. I, I don't even believe that any gangs existed in Vegas at that time. Paps quickly changed all that. He set up Sin City's first West Coast gang and began calling the shots. We were doing all kinds of shit. I'm talking about, you know, burglaries, home invasions, robberies. If it made money, we were involved in it. One brazen crime put Paps and his crew on the map. August 1981. Paps and his homeboys set out to rob a crowded casino bar after getting high on Sherm. He ended up in a shootout with the cops. The police shot as I went back in the door and the glass shattered. So um, my homeboy was next to me, so I took the gun and started shooting back at the police through the busted glass. Paps quickly took a hostage and locked himself in a nearby freezer. The negotiator came, the same you see in the movie. They got the place surrounded, they ain't gonna never get up out of here. They just gonna eventually end up killing us. Paps surrendered and served over 20 years in prison before being paroled. When he returned to the streets, he did so with a vengeance. I was that hardened gangster thug, street warrior, if you will, even more so than I was before, a you know, hundred times more. Paps has been in and out of prison for the last 30 years. And he doesn't see the notorious lifestyle going away anytime soon. Just like pouring water in a glass with no sides. It would just keep flowing and flowing. It has no end. Only a beginning, but no end. But for many notorious gangsters, there is an end. A violent one. Violence is the glue that keeps the organization going. And if you have a, an organization and you are not uh, ready to employ violence, extreme violence, it's killing people, you might as well get out of town. Death can come in many forms. The blade, the bullet, even the needle. I'm like kind of a, a professional mourner now, you know? Death don't really bother me like that. It hurt real bad when you love somebody and they died, but you know, I don't give a f about it no more. And when a gang wants someone taken out, they call on a professional, a stone cold killer. Most killers don't flaunt it. They don't walk around and flaunt it. They're some of the quietest guys. And when they explode, they're the loudest. Hitmen and assassins. Every gang's got one on the payroll. You're dealing with people that are no longer capable 
of feeling any humanity whatsoever. They are killing machines. Killing machines with no soul. Their techniques vary, but their results are the same. Heads and, and hands, they got dropped in big acid, you know, they dissolved the skin. So all you have is a skull, the skull is easy. You know, you break it up, you, you grind it down, you know, it's, it's ashes. But from the arms, legs, and torso that I you know, started cutting up, pieces that were small enough, a bird, a crow, or, you know, ants, will you know, real quick. Few killers have revealed their true identities to gangland. But one didn't hesitate. That's my mentality. I'm gonna hurt you or, 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 or do something real seriously to you where you can't come back. Most notorious killer, Scarface. Richard Merla, AKA Scarface, got his first taste of blood at age 17 when he shot and killed the stepfather of his pregnant girlfriend. I was a black sheep for the family. And I just took the, you know, wrong direction. And ever since then, I just been in and out of jail and prisons. In 1999, Scarface was recruited by the Banditos motorcycle gang. Soon, the gang tapped Scarface for a bigger role. Every time he needed something done, and I'm talking something dirty, I'm the first one that he would call. August 16, 2004, 3 a.m. Scarface and some friends were drinking beer in a backyard when one of his buddies picked a fight. The friend didn't realize that he had challenged a hired gun. It was a fist fight till the knife came out. I got grabbed and I just started stabbing him. And once I saw blood, that, that was it. There was no stopping me. His victim died on the driveway. Scarface now resides in a Texas prison where he is serving a 40-year sentence. He is eligible for parole in 2027. I wouldn't want to get out because I got one thing in my mind, and I'm telling you the truth. I wouldn't want to get out. So I'm better off in here. Gangster life. I'm from the streets and this is what's up. Look, bullet wound right there. Uh, still fresh and kind of looking ugly. Thousands aspire to live this violent, vicious lifestyle. The hood is where true gangsters are made. The hood is the jungle. So the most vicious, the most violent animal is gonna survive. This the biggest hole you ever see. The street has its own laws, its own government, and even its own military. Gangs. There's a lot of politics that go on in there, and gangs are a big part of it. You better respect them. They're like the army. On the front line are the street soldiers. The street soldier is uh, someone who's always on call ready to go get it done, no matter what time it is. You need somebody hit, you need somebody touched, you need somebody scared, you need somebody shook up. That's what a street soldier does, by any means necessary at all times. Every street soldier has one thing in common, a fierce loyalty to his hood. West Sam, real quick, stop it. It's not only his home, but also his livelihood. You got your blows, you got your rocks, or your weed. That's how we do it. Look at that. Most gangs rely on the money they make selling drugs. And soldiers will do anything to defend their territory. You got all these buildings shooting at you at one time, bullets flying past your head. So many different gunshots. Boom, boom, boom. The threat of death means nothing. Dying is part of it. That's the way it has to be. 
And that's the mentality that even the youngest gang member has. You go out there half-ass gang banging, you're not gonna survive. That's the scar from where they cut me open. This uh, is where I got shot nine times in the chest, stab wound. I've been shot 23 times on different occasions. I've been shot in the head, point blank, nine times in the chest and stomach. I got shot in the balls. Only the most notorious street soldiers have been to the brink and lived. The most notorious street soldier, Little Bear. My stomach right here and my intestines, they're all plastic. This is like plastic right here. I can't really feel this area right here. Few have paid more of a price than La Gran Familia's Hugo Rocha, AKA Little Bear. Despite his injuries, including damage to his hearing and speech, Little Bear feels lucky to be alive. Tell the truth, when I started game banging, I told my dad I wasn't gonna live to be 18. Growing up in Atlanta, Little Bear was introduced to the gang by his friends. We'd be tagging, smoking, um, drinking, you know, skipping school. I mean, we'd be breaking into houses, stealing cars. In 2003, Little Bear was outside his girlfriend's apartment when a rival gang member rolled up and pulled a gun. He shot me. He shot me in my legs. When I first started running, that's what made me fall. I got back up. He shot me at seven, eight more times in my stomach. Little Bear was rushed to the hospital and slipped into a coma. He woke up three months later. I couldn't talk, eat, move. I couldn't do anything, and I didn't even know who I was. Little Bear now uses his gruesome scars to show the consequences of being a street soldier. I'm actually glad that guy shot me, you know, because if he wouldn't have shot me, I really wouldn't know where I'd be now. I'd probably be dead or I'd probably in prison. There's no shortage of recruits in the hood. They're seduced by the promise of power. Street soldiers believe that this is the easy way to make money, gain prestige, power, and control. But for the most part, they never make it. Only a few select gangsters live past their teenage years. The most respected are those few who live long enough to be considered OGs. The OG the one who basically put the foundation down, who did it when it wasn't to be done, who basically lasted the longest. OG means first generation. What original means is before me, there was none, right? OGs shape their gang and typically work behind the scenes. People fear you more when they can imagine, you know, who you are and what you can do to them. It's like Charlie's Angels, you know? Nobody never sees Charlie. They only hear his voice. But Charlie make everything pop. Only the fearless rise through the ranks to become OGs. They're expected to earn their way to OG status. If your homeboy says, I need you to go with me to kill someone, you gotta go with him. But those who make it reap the rewards. That money that came in from it, man, it was so good, man. <laughs> You know, you couldn't stop, it was an addiction. Gangland's most notorious OG stands just five feet, five inches tall. But he's known as a giant in San Francisco's Chinatown. The world is under my feet. I'm not thinking I'm God, but in this city, I'm the man that caught a shot. Most notorious OG. Boy. I run this city. Who can tell me something I cannot do? Nobody. 
Raymond Chow, a.k.a. Shrimp Boy, started his ascent at an early age. By the time he was a teenager, Shrimp Boy was a trained martial artist. He was also a vicious street soldier with San Francisco's Hop Sing Boys. I just want to be the best gangster, be the best fighter. You, in your mind, you said it to you, want to take my ass. In my mind, I'm killing your ass. Shrimp Boy became the gang's leader, selling drugs and making serious cash in Chinatown's illegal gambling halls. We involved with the rap league, organized crime. We're dealing with drugs. We're dealing with money, gambling. Raymond was the hands-on guy. He was the one that was personally involved in a lot of criminal activities, and he was the violent one. The money and power were irresistible. One dinner, we spent $30,000. Anything you dream of it. We go to bed with seven girls. Ain't that fun? I mean, can you handle seven girls at one time? No. Shrimp Boy's high-flying life came to a halt when he was imprisoned on six counts of trafficking firearms. Now, Shrimp Boy says he's trying to go legit. I just, I just want to be the normal people. Just be accepted by my community. Not to be alone, like, inside the prison. Is he just doing a good job of pulling the wool over everybody's eyes? Maybe he is. Uh, we'll find out if he ever gets busted again, I suppose. America's gangs have created a secret world of symbols, colors, and codes. Misinterpret any of them, and it could lead to death. Hand signs. Go up the pole. Slang. Gangsters have many ways to scare off rivals. Don't be scared. Even the walls in the hood have a voice. What we got here is some real standard uh, NSM graffiti. See the N, S with the two lines through it, M for Northside Mafia. And the walls are like newspaper, you know, of uh, the neighborhood. Tagging is just one way that gang members represent. Gang life, representing, tagging on the wall, spray paint, disrespect, and crossing out. That's all part of gang lifestyle. But tagging isn't limited to the streets. For some gangsters, the only way to truly represent is with permanent ink. 713 Houston, H-Town, Center Houston skyline. When you get tattoos to represent your neighborhood, or you crossing out another neighborhood on your body, or you putting a city across your chest, you know, which bring respect. Yeah, LMG right there. But it's basically my hood, you know, something I live by, die by. The eye represents strength and knowledge. It's no all. Pyramid is like power, foundation. I did that myself with a straight race. That's a blood loss. That's north for life. I'm in these streets. I am the streets. Some tats symbolize a gangster's history. Others pay tribute to fallen homies. My cousin died in 05 in Baden on the north side of St. Louis. Got two shots to the head. But only the most notorious dare to flaunt their ink everywhere. With attitude to back it up. I love to kick ass. I'll come at you with a smile, but I will fight you just because it's cloudy outside. You know what I mean? Most notorious ink. Boxer. Steve Fierro, AKA Boxer. He's an enforcer with the Mongols Motorcycle Gang. When there's people out there who don't really agree with what has to be taken care of, I make sure that they agree with it. I don't take no for an answer. Boxer earned his nickname at an early age. 
My parents don't even call me by my, my given name. I, I'm an even boxer to my parents. His body ink shows his fierce dedication to the Mongols. I'm proud of my club, so I want everybody to know about it. A lot of them have different meanings. You know, we got the brother heads on us, like this. The MFFM that I have right here on my chin, it's Mongols Forever, Forever Mongols. This is telling you that I really don't give a about you, and if you want to do something, you can do it. Boxers Inc. reflects his philosophy. Go big or go home. When I first started, I got these on my face, and a lot of people were looking at me saying, hey, well, what do you got that genie for, you know? So I put the Mongols over so that they know what it is. Boxer's dedication to his gang will extend to the grave. I'll live for my brother, I'll die for my brother, I'll take a bullet for my brother. That's just the way I live. This undying loyalty is typical for all members of OMGs. What makes the difference between an outlaw biker and some of these other groups I think it's to, to the extent that you will defend yourself. It'd definitely be an honor for me to die for this club. That's it, brother, right there. OMGs consider themselves to be above the law. We're bikers. We're the outlaws. We're the best of the best. We make our own rules. They show their force in numbers. You get on your bike and you're with 30 or 40 guys. Everybody's riding to a breast. It's like having an extension of your kill. <laughs> Those who break the rules face serious consequences. It ain't no little f***ing girls club, man. This is a man's club. You want to f***ing man up, you're going to f***ing f*** up. You're going to take the f***ing man punishment. You don't want to take that? Take your little f***ing squat ass out the f***ing door. And those who dare leave the gang forfeit everything, even their ink. In their eyes, they own it. They'll, they'll cut it out or burn it out or, or grind it out of you. They'll take it back with a belt sander or they'll take it back with a clothes iron. They'll put a hot clothes iron right on that tattoo and lift it right off your body. Only the most dedicated need join. Absolutely positively. Most notorious biker, Jimmy D. Jimmy D. Gregorio, AKA Jimmy D, spent more than 10 years riding with the Pagans on the mean streets of Philly. One for all, all for one. Let's die together, let's fight together, let's f together. For Jimmy D, the Pagans were the doorway to a life of debauchery. If there wasn't group sex, I never would have joined the Pagans. It was one big orgy. Everybody get naked and jump in a pile. Life in the fast lane required a boost. For the Pagans, that came in the form of methamphetamine. Meth is the key drug of most motorcycle gangs, most bikers. It keeps you up, makes your party longer, makes your ride longer. Jimmy D cooked pure meth for the gang. They then developed ingenious ways to increase profits, cutting the meth with different substances, including baby laxative. Manitol. And the best part is, people used to do a line snort, a line of meth, and have to go to the bathroom. And when they went to the bathroom, they would come out and go, man, that's good stuff, I had to go to the bathroom. Little did they know, it was because they were doing baby laxative. Jimmy D was making so much money that he caught the eye of the Italian mafia. Mickey Scarfo was the boss of the Philadelphia mob. At some point, he decided that we were going to pay a street tax to the mob to be allowed to deal drugs in Philadelphia. He lost his mind when he thought that he could shake down the Pagan Motorcycle Club for street tax. Jimmy D responded by kidnapping two mobsters and shooting one of them in broad daylight. And I got out of the car and shot him in front of the cops. 
Jimmy D's stint in jail was short-lived. The time meant nothing to him. When the Pagans go to take care of business, they go to take care of business. Repercussions don't matter. Results don't matter. It's brotherhood. There is a universal symbol inked onto the skin of gang members across the country. Three simple dots in a triangle. It represents the only three possible outcomes of gang life. Prison, a hospital bed, or the grave. Prison can be like death. At some point in the time, in a criminal's mind, you think you slick. It's some kind of ego that goes with it. You know, but that's quickly erased with prison. Inside, there are only two types of gangsters. You're either a wolf or a rabbit. And ain't no in-between. you either a wolf or a rabbit. Rabbits get ate. Prison life is strictly divided along racial lines. Well, in prison, the gang system is completely different than the streets, meaning that if I got a problem with, with you on the streets and I'm trying to kill you and you're trying to kill me, the minute we get behind bars, that is over with. We have to become black, and it's a race thing now. These guys like to segregate themselves on this yard by race. Off to my left, you can see the inmates over here. This is our, our white area. Over here, you'll have your skinheads. And then off to the right, you'll have your southern Mexicans from Southern California. The Serenos is what we call them. Gangsters new to the pen need protection. And there's only one way to get it. Prison gangs are the top of the food chain. You know, in the predator world, the criminal world, prison gangs make the rules. It's a wake-up call for even the hardest individuals. I had hit the big house, but I seen some things in there and uh, did some things in there that I didn't know I was capable of doing. I thought the wars on the street were surmountable, but the wars that were going on in prison were just as violent. Gaining membership into these gangs isn't easy. We considered ourselves to be professional criminals. We didn't take or accept rapists or child molesters or snitches or nothing like that. You had to be vicious. If you took a guy out and just butchered his ass in front of everybody, other people seen that and they didn't want it happening to them. Yet even among this dangerous group, some cons stand out. Violence got the message across like nothing else could. You could talk till you were blue in the face. But the thing they did understand, particularly in a controlled environment where you can't get away, was violence. Most notorious convict, Big Mike. You killed a man, you cut his head off and kicked it down the, the walkway to instill fear in individuals. It was extreme, it was extraordinary. It was unlike anything that you saw anywhere else. Michael Thompson, AKA Big Mike, was serving a life sentence at California's Folsom State Prison when he first hooked up with the Aryan Brotherhood. I was extremely naive about the, the way things were and how things operated. Well, this is the big house, and this is where the big boys play. At six foot four inches and weighing 285 pounds, he was seduced by the promise of brotherhood and unity. They make you feel good, make you feel proud, make you feel like you're a part of. And of course, all of us are looking for that, particularly in prison. Big Mike mastered the art of war. His weapon of choice, the shank. When you engage in a knife fight, and you're driving up on a man and you feel that knife enter his body and that air comes out of him and you feel that energy drained. It changes your life forever. I don't care who you are.
when inmates are released. They take the racial hatred they learned inside back to the streets. You're gonna have hate anywhere you go. Just because there's mansions down the, each side of the street doesn't mean you're not gonna find hate. Hate's all over the place. And nowhere is this hate more prevalent than with white supremacist gangs. White power! The white power movement comes in many forms. From white robes, to shaved heads and combat boots. I have skinhead across my knuckles. I have Sieg Heil across my back. Different German slangs, different Third Reich symbols. Most people will not even look at me twice without pretty much pissing their pants. White supremacists believe non-Aryans are less than human. Blacks wouldn't be a problem if they didn't rape our women, sell dope to our kids, impose their culture of theft, gangs, violence. This right here is the Jew flag. Usually when we have big events, people will wipe their feet on it, spit on it, whatever they feel like doing to it. Everybody from the IK, all the skinheads, we all hate Jews, so. But every movement needs a leader. I don't, I don't threaten their lives, but I don't care. If they fell down a flight of stairs and broke their neck, it wouldn't bother me. Most notorious white supremacist, Tom Metzger. I was fighting for every white working man in the country that cared about being white. 72-year-old Tom Metzger is the president of White Aryan Resistance, or WAR. He has been recruiting young white men for more than 20 years. White power. White power. I'm Johnny Appleseed. I've been planting seeds for decades. Those seeds are growing up, and they're going to grow up a lot more. Metzger is convinced the country is headed for a race war and is preparing his troops for battle. You're probably going to see revolution of, and civil war in your lifetime. Definitely. This country's going to go down the tube like mad. Metzger says he does not condone violence, but has no sympathy for his movement's victims. Well, uh, violence works. Violence applied properly is effective. I don't encourage it, but I don't care. Notorious gangsters come in many forms. From shot callers, to street soldiers, to OGs, to killers. All we do is pull the trigger. They are all after the same thing. Respect. Respect. That's a small word, but it holds a lot of value. Respect can't be bought, it's gotta be earned. And the only way to earn it is the old fashioned way. You gotta take it. But of the hundreds we've met on Gangland, only one has enough respect to be considered the most notorious gangster. They call it the Grim Reaper. Looking for a knife to snatch. Most notorious gangster. Boom. Nate Craft, AKA Boone, was a high paid hitman for the Best Friends Gang, which ruled Detroit, Michigan. Boone asked to have his identity concealed. People hear about it, they like, you see the guy called Boone? Big black ball head. Most of the time, you got a hood and glasses on. If you see him, you know you did. He is responsible for 30 murders. His scars tell his story. I was set on fire. Also received a shotgun blast. All this was from people that didn't like me. Boone was in his late 20s when he was recruited by the notorious Best Friends. What they were doing it was a murder game. You only get one shot at that. 
There's no second chances. There's no third chances. You get one shot. Boone started doing hits for the gang, making as much as $50,000 per killing. Once you got a little taste of money, you wanted more money. You never could get enough. If you see a guy 19, or you see a guy 20 years old in a blazer with custom Louis Vuitton tops with gold rims, and the car is just banging a sound system that's louder than Joe Louis Arena, you know what's going down. Boone didn't just do it for the money. He took pleasure in making his victims sweat. Most guys, I will make them suffer. They know I'm coming for them, so I'll let them know I'm coming for you. Sometimes I'll just show them that pass me. Hey, how you doing? I'm not there to do you yet. But you know I'm coming. Boone's killing spree ended when he was arrested on drug charges. He cooperated with authorities in exchange for a reduced sentence. But snitching on a gang has lifelong consequences. I usually be in the hunter. Now I got people doing me, trying to do me. That feel weird because now I gotta watch my back. Boone has a warning for the man who tries to take him out. They could count on one thing. You better make sure the first bullet counts. Because then that ain't nothing gonna stop me till I get my hands wrapped around them throwing and snatch it. Hopefully I'll be able to take them to hell with me. I'm not going by myself. Snoop Dogg and Ice-T have climbed from the depths of the hood. But even so, the realities of the notorious life aren't far away. One of my boys just got killed last week. You know, so you get these calls, man. It's like, what's really going on, man? What's really, really going on? It's not a game and it's not music and it's not entertainment, it's real. Bullets pop. And they don't have no names and they coming. Their advice for those who aspire to be the most notorious. Take heed and choose wisely. In the minds of those soldiers, they feel this is a real war. You dig? And uh, how do you stop a war? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Yeah, I did join the gang and I went through it the hard way. And I had to learn and understand that it started off as family and then it ended up as, you know, money. And then it ended up as, you know, greed. And all of those things make for one thing, death, period. What kind of candles do you want on your cake? What you want them to read on your obituary?